Welcome to another deep dive. This time you've given us Richard Dawkins's The Blind Watchmaker. It's uh, pretty dense stuff. Definitely a classic in evolutionary biology. Well, we're going to try to unpack it, break down Dawkins' arguments against creationism, and really explore his case for evolution by natural selection. And he uses all sorts of tools to do it, you know, analogies and thought experiments and... Uh, Oh, even computer models. It's part of what makes the book so engaging. He takes these really complex ideas and makes them, well, surprisingly understandable. Right. So how about we start with that famous analogy, creationists love. The watchmaker. The idea that a watch is so complex it must have had a maker, so living things must have a creator too. Ah, uh, yes. The argument for design, it goes all the way back to William Paley in the 18th century. And Dawkins kind of flips that on its head. He says, yeah, there's a watchmaker in nature, but... It's blind. It doesn't have a plan or anything. It's just physics and natural selection working away. Exactly. Yeah. And to illustrate this, he uses a really powerful example. A bird. Uh, well, a thrown bird. Oh, I remember this one. It's a great image. So picture this. You throw a dead bird up in the air. What happens? It follows this simple arc. Right. Pulled down by gravity, like a watch obeying physical laws. But a live bird. A live bird uses those same laws to fly, to navigate, to do all these incredibly complex things. So both are subject to physics, but the live one's using those laws for something way more complicated. Exactly. The live bird, or any living thing really, is built from pieces that follow the laws of physics. But the way those pieces are organized, that leads to something much more intricate than just a simple arc. Like the difference between a pile of bricks and, well, a whole cathedral built from those bricks. That's a great way to put it. Okay, so that's the blind watchmaker. But how does Dawkins deal with that argument that something as complex as an eye couldn't have just popped up by chance? Well, he starts with another analogy. This one's a bit more um, mathematical. He talks about a monkey randomly typing Shakespeare. The odds of that happening are practically zero. Yeah, that's not happening anytime soon. Definitely not. But then he introduces this idea of cumulative selection. So instead of the monkey just hitting keys randomly, imagine a computer program. It starts with a random string of letters, then copies it over and over. Each time it makes little errors, kind of like typos. Then the program picks the offspring string that's closest to a target phrase. Say like, me thinks it is like a weasel. So it's like the program's guiding the process, choosing those little improvements over time. Precisely. And even though there are random changes happening over many, many generations, the program can reach that target phrase surprisingly fast. And this is where it gets really cool. Dawkins links this to evolution, right? Absolutely. Those random changes are like the typos in the computer program and natural selection. That's the selector, favoring the changes that help an organism survive and reproduce. Over vast stretches of time, that can lead to some incredibly complex adaptations. It's amazing that these tiny changes can add up to something as intricate as an eye or a wing. And to show this, Dawkins actually created a computer model, the biomorphs. Yeah, this is where you really see his passion for, uh, well, experimenting with these ideas. He designed a program that basically simulates evolution on a computer screen. It starts with simple shapes, it's kind of like little trees, then it uh, generates variations. And the user gets to choose which ones reproduce, kind of like mimicking natural selection. So, like, digital evolution, what happened? Well, even Dawkins was surprised. The biomorphs evolved beyond those basic tree shapes really quickly. They developed all these complex symmetries, intricate details, things he never expected. So, pretty amazing results. What does that tell us about evolution as a whole? It shows that evolution isn't just random. It's more like a search through a huge space of possibilities. Think of it like a landscape. And every point on that landscape is a different life form. Evolution through those random changes in selection, it's like navigating that landscape, exploring what's possible. So evolution's less like a monkey with a typewriter and more like an artist exploring a giant studio full of all kinds of materials. I like that. The studio is like the potential that's already there. Yeah. And natural selection is the artist's guiding hand, shaping and refining. Great way to visualize it. Now let's get to one of those big arguments against evolution. Complex organs like the eye. Creationists often say, what good is half an eye? You know, how could something so complex evolve in stages? Dawkins has a great response to that. He points out that any small improvement in vision, even something basic, gives you a survival advantage. Even just being able to tell light from dark or sense movement, that could be the difference between life and death. I remember he brings up the Nautilus as an example here. Right, the Nautilus. It has what's called a pinhole eye. 
Basically, it's a chamber with a tiny opening for light, and it creates a blurry image on the retina, much simpler than our eyes, which have a lens to focus the light. So the Nautilus eye is like an early prototype, maybe a step towards those more complex eyes? Exactly. And the interesting thing is, the Nautilus eye works perfectly fine, even without a lens. It shows that even those imperfect steps in evolution can be beneficial, and they can provide the foundation for further development down the line. Which brings up another point. If there were a, well, an intelligent designer, why would there be so many imperfections in nature? Yeah, you wouldn't design an eye and leave out the lens. Right. Dawkins argues those imperfections are actually evidence for evolution. He says that biological structures often have these uh, these hallmarks of their evolutionary history. It's like those flatfish with both eyes on one side of their head. Ah, uh, yeah. Bizarre. But it makes sense in the context of evolution. Flatfish evolved from fish that swam upright with eyes on both sides. But as they adapted to living on the seafloor, one eye gradually moved over and left them with this, well, kind of twisted skull. Far from perfect. But, hey, it works. So evolution's working with what it's got, not starting from scratch each time. What are some other examples of these uh, evolutionary quirks? Well, Dawkins talks about the panda's thumb. It's not a real thumb like ours. It's actually a modified wrist bone. Mm -hmm. Clunky, not as efficient, but it lets pandas grasp bamboo, which is, you know, pretty essential for them. So those imperfections actually make more sense when you see them as products of this long evolutionary process. Exactly. They're like clues, remnants of that journey that led to all the diversity we see today. Okay, so we've got blind watchmakers, imperfect designs, this vast landscape of evolutionary possibilities. What else does Dawkins use to build his case? Well, he talks about evolutionary arms races. Think about gazelles and cheetahs. Gazelles evolve to run faster to escape, which pushes cheetahs to get faster and develop better hunting strategies. So it's this constant back and forth, each side pushing the other. Yeah, and that leads to some incredibly complex adaptations. The speed of cheetahs, the camouflage of insects, the venomous fangs of snakes, all of these are products of those arms races. It's like nature's playing this constant game of one-upmanship. But wouldn't that mean things are always getting better, more perfect? Shouldn't evolution lead to some kind of ultimate organism? That's a common misconception. Mm -hmm. Dawkins says those races aren't always about constant improvement. Sometimes it's just about keeping up, you know, maintaining a balance. The cheetah might get faster, but so does the gazelle. So it's not necessarily about progress, but about survival in a changing world. Makes sense. Now let's talk genes. Dawkins presents this idea of genes as uh, selfish entities. How does that work if organisms are clearly cooperative? I mean, our bodies are made up of trillions of cells working together. Right. It's a bit of a paradox. Genes, in a sense, are selfish. Their main goal is to replicate and get passed on. But that doesn't mean they can't cooperate. Natural selection actually favors genes that work well together. If a gene messes up the development of a vital organ, well, it's not going to get passed on. So it's in their best interest to play nice, at least to a certain extent? You could say that. Genes that contribute to a well-functioning organism have a better chance of success. Dawkins even talks about gene duplication as a way of adding complexity. When a gene gets copied, the new copy can evolve new functions, expanding the network within the organism. So like building a more complex watch, adding new gears and springs. Yeah, I like that analogy. Each gene is like a component in the machinery of life. And over time, that machinery can become incredibly sophisticated. Speaking of complexity, Dawkins talks about these things called positive feedback loops in evolution. What are those exactly? Okay, think of how a rumor spreads. One person whispers something and then it just explodes as more people hear and repeat it. That's a positive feedback loop, a small change leading to a much bigger effect. I see how that works socially, but how does it apply to evolution? Dawkins uses the example of widow birds. They have these really long tails, and females prefer males with longer tails. So males with even slightly longer tails have an advantage when it comes to mating, which means those genes for longer tails get selected for even more. A runaway train of tail length. Exactly. These loops can lead to rapid change and the development of, well, some pretty exaggerated traits. They can push species down some unexpected paths. It's fascinating, but also kind of scary. Like evolution can get carried away sometimes. Absolutely. It reminds us that evolution isn't about some perfect ideal. It's a dynamic process, sometimes unpredictable, that can lead to amazing adaptations, but also, you know, some pretty quirky solutions along the way.
Okay, my brain is definitely full. Blind watchmakers, imperfect designs, arms races, selfish genes, runaway evolution. Anything else essential to Dawkins' case that we should touch on? There's just so much to unpack in The Blind Watchmaker. He even talks about how evolution branches out, not like languages, which sometimes uh, blend, mm -hmm. and the importance of molecular evidence, you know, comparing DNA to build those family trees. Mm -hmm. But I think the main takeaway, the thing that really sticks with you is that evolution by natural selection, it's blind, but it builds complexity step by tiny step. It is mind-blowing when you think about it that way. All this incredible life on Earth, just from this constant dance of adaptation, no grand scheme, just the drive to, well, survive and reproduce. And all those imperfections, those quirky designs, not mistakes, they're more like timestamps, I guess, yeah. showing how evolution kind of tinkered with things to solve new problems. It really is like evolution's a master improviser, making the most of what's there. So if we're not the end goal of evolution, then where do we fit in? That's the big question, isn't it? The one Dawkins wants us to think about. If evolution's all about adapting, not reaching some perfect ideal, well, it changes how we see ourselves in the world. We're just part of this massive tapestry connected to all life. It's a humbling thought, but also kind of freeing, don't you think? Like, we don't have to be the pinnacle of creation. We can just appreciate the the sheer beauty of it all, of the process itself. Exactly. And if if you find yourself really intrigued by this stuff, I can't recommend The Blind Watchmaker enough. Dawkins is so good at explaining these really complex ideas, and he does it with such wit. It's a surprisingly fun read. Definitely agree with you there. It's one of those books that can really shift your perspective. And for everyone listening to this deep dive, having these excerpts as a starting point, well, you've gotten a great overview of, of what Dawkins is all about. But remember, this is just the beginning. Science is about constant learning and questioning and discovery. So keep exploring the natural world with that same curiosity. Well said. Thanks for joining us on this deep dive into The Blind Watchmaker. Until next time, keep those brains buzzing.